Yesterday we were discussing the second tenet of Jewish belief. We speak, spoke about the unity of God that, and we explained, it doesn't mean when we say God is one and only, it doesn't mean there's nothing comparable to who he is because he's so unique and so special. But one means nothing exists outside of him because every aspect of existence emanates from him because the energy which allows the ex nihilo process to happen is emanates from him. So everything is continuously a derivative of himself. And this is the meaning of Echod. Nothing exists outside of him. In the words of Rambam, Maimonides, when he speaks about the fundamentals of Torah, he says everything else that exists, wherever it may be, on the physical realm, the spiritual realm, the celestial realm, whatever realm it may be, it's all dependent on something else. And if whatever it's dependent on would cease to be, whatever that is dependent on will cease to be also. God is not dependent on anyone. God is independent of anything else. God's existence, in the words of Rambam, is muhrach hametzius. He exists because he exists. His existence is not dependent on anything but on himself. Everything else exists. It's dependent on something else. And what is that something else? God's willing that existence to exist. So if he ceases to will it should exist, no longer exists. This is the unity of God. Everything is unified through God's willing it to be. That's the unity of God. So we say in the Shema, Echod, that's exactly what the word Echad means. Not one and only in terms of nothing's comparable, but rather he is the only one, and therefore there's nothing that could be compared to that because he's the basis for all existence. That's the understanding of Echad. Just to mention that we find that on the first day of creation, when the day was completed, God said, ye are let to be light. And the Torah says, vayere vayvoke yom Echad. It was evening, it was morning, it was one day. The Torah doesn't use the term similar to the other days. The second day says it was the second day, the third day, the fourth day. So Rashi cites the Midrash. Why is the first day referred to as one day? It should be referred to as the first day. A second, what precedes the second first? So why does the Torah say it was evening, it was morning, it was one day? So Rashi explains because when were angels created? Angels were created on the second day of creation. The, so the only thing that existed in existence was God himself. Therefore it's Echod. He was the Echod. He was the only one. So the morale of Prague explains that once the angels came into being and the various dimensions of angels, the various echelons of angels, as we say in the morning, uh, prayer, we speak about Ofanim, Chayos HaKodesh, Serofim, the Seraphites. These angels emit and have a dimension of holiness and radiate that God forbid God's real radiance is actually diminished because there's a little bit of a confusion believing that these entities are independent of God. The first day, there were no other entities. So everybody understood. There's only one. The source of everything is God himself. Once the second day came into being, which angels were created, the dimension of angel within the spiritual realm is so unfathomable, there could be a little bit of a confusion that something exists outside of God himself. But that's what God created. So when was it echod, indisputably, unquestionably, irrefutably, that God is the only one in existence. That was the first day of creation. Once the angels came in to existence, it doesn't change the reality, but now the perception is a much more difficult perception if you understand what exists on the second day going forward. We find at Sinai, we, we say anything we know on an absolute level is because of the, the Sinai experience. God openly communicated with every Jew at Sinai. Every aspect of our being, the purpose of existence, the reality of existence, all that was com communicated at Sinai, and the Jews all prophesied the wake state. 
So there were no questions. No questions whatsoever. The Ramchal, Rabbi Lutzato, writes that the experience of prophecy, anybody who's a true prophet, the level of clarity and absoluteness of that experience, there's nothing comparable to that. And it leaves an emblazoned impression upon the person's soul that it's something you become a different human being. Even a person prophesizes for a moment at the lowest level of prophecy, the person becomes a changed being. He's a changed being. The Jews at Sinai prophesied in a wake state. It was the same state as Moshe Rabbeinu, not in a sleep state, which we once discussed why it had to be this way. So the what they amassed, the factual knowledge and the realities, and God opened heaven and earth and showed them that nothing exists in existence outside of himself. You see the galaxies, you see the sun, the moon, you see angels. But they were at a level, they had a capacity at that moment to appreciate that nothing exists outside of God. And all this, what they do see, only manifestations, God willing those, those entities into, into being. So going forward from Sinai, we can't be deceived. Why can't we be deceived? Because our tradition, which is what we call Mesorah, the transmission from Sinai, where does the transmission start? It starts from factual evidence, which is irrefutable on an absolute level. Once you start there, you could question it from now to doomsday. That maybe what you saw, maybe what you thought, maybe what you processed wasn't accurate. Not possible. Because the Jews at Sinai, their experience there was prophesizing in a wake state. There's nothing comparable to that. It's like a person who's a, who sees, and the, blind, and the person sees, says, I see something which is beautiful. So the blind man says, could you prove it to me? The blind man doesn't even know what light looks like. There's no way to describe light to him. And yet he says, but I don't want empirical evidence. Empirical. That's a very, unfortunately, common use, usage of a word. Empir empirical. We need hardcore evidence. But we know, you know, seeing is believing. But the eye can be de deceiving. But not the eye of prophecy. A prophet is, sees things in the absolute. And God revealed himself on an absolute level to every Jew to understand nothing exists outside of himself. So when we speak about the tenets of Judaism, I believe with absolute faith that God is one, not the only one, meaning this, he's one of a kind. He's the only one. Nothing exists outside of him because everything is contingent on his willing existence. And it should, for a moment, he should cease willing that. It's not the world will be destroyed. We, we revert back to pre-existence, which is something which we can't relate to because pre-existence, all that existence was God himself and God being infinite, there's no way to visualize or understand what that is. As we explained yesterday, the greatest angel cannot fathom God because everything which was created is finite. And finite means it's within a certain limitation. Something limited can't relate or grasp or fathom something which has no beginning and no end. So that's the Achtus Hashem. That's the Echot of the Shema. That the Jew, when he dies and he declares his faith in the Almighty, he's one, he's only one. So let's talk now. If a person gives his life to God for God and they take his life, Reb Kiva was the greatest of the ten martyrs. He was the greatest Torah sage in the history of the Jewish people in the Tanaic period. One of the greatest Torah sages. The Romans tortured the life out of him. They scaved the flesh off his body. And he expired with the word Echod on his lips. Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echod. When he said the word Echod, he died at that moment. When he died, due to this torture and this murder, which they perpetrated the Romans, a heavenly voice called out from heaven, 
you are pure and your soul is pure. That was the heavenly voice that came out from heaven. God confirmed the Reb Kiva when he said the word Echad, he left this world in a pure state. You are pure and your soul is pure. Every moment of pain that a person experiences, why do we experience the pain the way we experience it? To that point, at that level, the pain quotient, whatever, whatever we experience, why are we experiencing it at that level? Well, you say because you know we have a, a nervous system, and they're, 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 the brain is connected to every part of the body. And when you experience a certain thing, there communication between the brain and the nervous system. And that's why we experience it. But why does it operate this way? Why does it function this way? Why will we taste something? We teach taste something sweet without taste buds. If it's sweet, it, we taste sweetness. Do two people taste the exact level of sweetness? We have no idea. We both eat something sweet. You say it's sweet, I say it's sweet. But do we? is it exactly the same? When we see something and we internalize its beauty, we both see beauty and we're amazed and we're impressed by it and we enjoy it. Is it exactly, are we experiencing identically the same level of experience? Only God knows. The way you experience something is the way God wills that you should function. To that degree, no more, no less. If two human beings, no two people are exactly identically alike, we're similar but not alike, the way we, our emotional makeup is diff definitely, we know the nuances of difference between two human beings, even husband and wife, children and parents, they're from the same DNA, same gene pool, but the differences. So just as the differences in that, the differences in experiences, we process things differently. It may be similar, but not identically the same. But why do we process things differently? Now, what is the body? The body is, this, is the context in which the soul functions. If the soul has a purpose, and the purpose of the soul as the composite with the body is to be in a challenged position and to make choices, that body experiences those experiences, those challenges to accommodate the soul, that if it makes the right decision, then it succeeded. Then there's a tremendous value to that. But each experience is tailor-made to that soul. So not only is the challenge made to the soul, even the way the challenge is processed, internalized, is a different challenge. But every aspect of that, why do we experience the pain, the pleasure? Because God wants, God wills an energy that the nervous system and the body, the physicality, the spirituality processes and internalizes it and experiences at that level. Whatever level that is, we have no idea. So when a person dies and he has pain, why does he have that level of pain? Because God wills an energy which allows you to experience that level of pain. So why are you experiencing it? It's because the one who's taking your life wants to give you that pain or could God wants you to experience that pain before you die or any time in your lifetime because that pain has value. Because otherwise God wouldn't will it. The energy which allows the, the, the nervous system to manifest itself in a way where you experience pleasure and pain, which has to do with the parts of the brain and the nerve endings in the body, how everything's connected, because that's God wills the energy to allow that being and the composite and the profile medically, mentally, emotionally, it's all in in interconnected. But that's all part of the echo. Person says, it doesn't make sense. Does that expression have any relevance to anything? We cannot make sense. But experience, it doesn't make sense. It makes plenty of sense. Because it can't happen unless God wills it should happen. So if God, if it can't happen unless God wills it to happen, because everything is echot, because nothing exists outside of God, so why is it happening? It's only happened because God wills it should happen. The energy that allows that to happen and manifest itself to the smallest detail 
is because Wad's willing, it should be to that degree. The Talmud tells us in one location, in Odom no kifetz po lemato, elam ki machriz no mato. A person does not stub his finger on the threshold level unless at that moment it was pronounced from heaven that you should stub your finger. Pe- people are careless, but not everybody stubs their finger. Not, not everybody, don't are careful the way they walk, but not everybody falls and breaks their leg. Or God forbid it falls on their face. So why did this person feel, fall on his face? The other person did it. Why did you stub your finger? The other person didn't stub your finger. Because it was pronounced from above, you should stub your finger. That means, and that you should experience the pain to the degree that you experience it. But, but what's the system? How does the system work? You know what the system's called? It's called echod. It's called the unity of God. Because everything that exists is only expression of God himself. And if you should cease willing it, it no longer exists. As a result of that, when you do experience it, it's because he's allowing you to experiencing it, to experience it that way, because he's releasing an energy, which is an expression of himself that you should experience it that way. We speak of one punishment. It's a known, known word from Rabbi Shol Salanter. We say every, say every morning a Mishnah, after we say the blessings on the Torah, the things, that the use of frucht is consumed in this world, meaning the prophets, the fruits, but the principles intact in the world to come which is a tremendous thing. You know, if a person goes and he has his, his basic cap, base capital, he goes and swanders it. So when he needs that capital, it's not available. God, when you do certain mitzvahs, it generates two levels, cap, principle and profits. The profits, he allows you to use in this world. So when you have that benefit, the b- benefit is not in any way diminishing the principle whatsoever. So when a person passes from this world, that principle is intact to the world to come. Let's say, God forbid, God starts paying you the principle in this world. You come there, you thought you had so much in, in the account, you find out you have a quarter left in the account because you withdrew it in this world. But if we say that a whiff of the world to come is more than if you encapsulate all the pleasures of this world into one moment, it's not the equivalent of a whiff of the world to come. What have you given up for this world by giving up for the world to come? The word insanity is an understatement. An understatement. Could you imagine a person wants to eat a pastrami sandwich, a club with mustard and the pickle and whatever condiments you want, and he's going to pay a billion dollars for the sandwich? Better the man should die and the money should go to charity. The word insanity, there's no word. The man has to be insane, demented, unstable. To have any level of pleasure and to that should be the exchange for the world to come. We say, we read in P.K. Office and Ethics of the Fathers, there's not enough reward in this world to reward you for one mitzvah. That's why you can't, you're not compensated in this world. It's only the world to come. That is the enormity and the unending level of the value of a mitzvah. So if you do, do make a withdrawal in this world, that pleasure you have, who's offering you that pleasure? That energy, God is expending and you're using it. You understand? That's why it costs you. If it's something you just pick up in the street, it's unrelated to God. But God is expending, creating that energy for you because you want to withdraw from from your account in the world to come. The world to come is another level of energy. The world to come is having relation with God. As it says, you sit and bask in the radiance of God. We don't know what that is. But that is something which is, there's nothing comparable. As I said, one moment of that is all pleasure and value of this world encapsulated into one moment. So if God says, persons, but I want this world, that's what I prefer. God says, no, no problem. So God makes an exchange. 
when you benefit from this world, God is expending an energy for you in this world. So therefore it's an exchange. It's an energy in the physical world, which is God emanate, emitting that energy for the energy he would have emitted in the world to come that you as a spiritual being would be a beneficiary of the ultimate level of value, which is the, in the spiritual realm. Therefore it's considered a withdrawal. But this all goes into the echod, because you've already had to do with the echod. The world to come is you cleave to the echod, to that infinite being, which nobody exists outside of him. But you re- you've already cleaved here. You've, you already re- have gotten your due in this world. Therefore, if you've gotten your due in this world, there's nothing due in the world to come. Account closed, or c- account withdrawn and you have your signature on that you, you're on the withdrawal slip that you withdrew that from that account but a person doesn't realize what he gave up until it's too late because he already withdrew it from the account so Rishobh Slata writes so how do you play it safe you know we talk about Wall Street people everybody's hedging hedging it's hedging because you never know to guarantee your situation so Rishobh Slata says let's say a person has good fortune and he lives a comfortable life, all the amenities of life, the comforts of life, pleasures of life, yes, make take many liberties. But do we ever know what the, those liberties and those comforts cost? We never know, never know. He says, good advice, play it safe. You know what you do? If you have to reinvest it. If you reinvest it, you're guaranteed the count is intact, plus you have profit. Because you never know, maybe that pleasure may be a withdrawal. So if you live your life for the sake of God and for the sake of doing his will, you're always on safe ground. Otherwise, you may never know. You may be going that slope so quickly down that slope, the slippery slope. By the time you hit the bottom, there's nothing left. God forbid. And even if there's an iota deducted from the count, what have you given up? You've given up something infinite for what? Something that's finite, which innately has no value. Now, there's an expression in Yiddish they used to say, I'm going to speak to people who were brought up with a little bit of Yiddish. They don't have to know how to speak Yiddish well. In Yiddish, the word devil is the tyvel. Tyvel is the devil. So people used to say, Ich arbeit for the tyvel. I'm working for the devil. The people work and work. At the end, it all turns out to be nothing. So people say, who am I working for? I'm working for the devil. Of course, there's no return. People don't realize when you make that withdrawal, who did you feed? You're working for the devil. He hoodwinked you and he convinced you. You also have a right to good things, pleasurable things. But the question is, what's the, what's the cost factor? You know, you have a salesman He'll sell you the Brooklyn Bridge. You know what he's told the Brooklyn Bridge? You go on that trolley back and forth every moment of the days for, for the next 40 years. So now that you've gone back and forth 40, for the next 40 years, what do you have at the end of the day? Once you leave this earth, there's not even a trace of your existence. So what's it worth? Well, the thrill. You look down from the bridge, the Brooklyn Bridge, and you see what? You see nothing. Well, but you know what it means to see? It's like jumping off the Empire State Building. How many people have jumped off? You know what kind of thrill it is? If the, that, that's, that's a thrill if you don't want, if you want to end your life, it's a thrill because you can't tolerate existence any longer. But if you understand opportunity, nobody in his sane mind would take his life. There's too much opportunity you give it up. So to give up infinite, the finite, which even in the finite, it has no value. It's insanity. Therefore, Rousseau Slant says, I give you good advice. Whatever you have in this world, just keep reinvesting it. Reinvest it. It's interesting, you know, a Jew who's an observant Jew, he doesn't eat anything unless it's predicated on a blessing. Eat food, you drink something. And you have to, it's an acknowledgement. What is the acknowledgement? It's a declaration of your belief. God the master almighty king of the universe created the fruit of the tree, the fruit of the ground, all came about through his word. 
So even if the motivation is to satisfy your physical pleasures, but at least you recognize that it's from God, that this pleasure wouldn't, I wouldn't have unless God, it's God given. That itself may be, although you may be a hedonist and you may be a glutton, but you want to know something, me as a glutton, nevertheless, I have my head in the feed bag. Before I put my head in that feed bag, I acknowledge who provided that feed bag. It's God, the master, the king of the universe. The Almighty provided it. So Chazal, the rabbis, when they legislate these blessings, even if you're off, you're going off the rails simultaneously. But if you observe even the basic beliefs and behavior patterns, you know something? That's the anchor that holds on to you that you shouldn't go off the rails totally. Because at least you acknowledged that my hedonistic pleasures is only because God provided them which puts a slight positive spin on that reality. I remember many years ago, Ramosha Feinstein, Tzarek Levrocho, who was the leading decisor in the world, and he already was not well, and it was the last dinner he uh, which was for his yeshiva, there was a banquet to raise money, fundraiser, and Ramosha Feinstein was a short man, and he passed away, he was 95 years old, reviewed the Talmud over 400 times, had it committed to memory on his fingertips, and he was proficient in everything. Instant recall. He wrote thousands and thousands of responsa, never retracted a response to which he had given. That was his level of proficiency and clarity. And there was a man, an older man, who was about his age, maybe a little bit younger, who wanted to have the honor of walking Rabbi Feinstein into the banquet hall for the dinner and walking him up to the dais. Sit on dais. The man was not an observant man, but he was a traditional Jew. He was willing to pay $40,000, this I'm going back now, 50 years ago, to have the honor to walk Rabbi Feinstein up to the days. It was a lot of money. And this man who had the money, he understands what a lot of money is. $40,000 was a lot of money. So I asked myself a question. I heard, this, heard it when it happened. I said, if you value Rabbi Feinstein to such a degree, that's his innate value, although he can't hold up a candle to you in terms of the material, what you have and what he has. So that means you value him minimally to pay for the honor of $40,000. But what's the innate worth of Rabbi Feinstein? It's a spirituality. It's the Torah he studied. So why don't you study Torah? The one who's paying for the honor. Take out time, study Torah, and you'll have something which gives Rabbi Feinstein that special value that you're willing to pay the $40,000 for. Why not? But you want to know something? The most illogical creature on this earth is the human being. I'm willing to pay $40,000 for it, but I don't have five minutes to study. But you realize every five minutes, even a minute, what's its value? You're fulfilling a mitzvah. A mitzvah has, is not quantifiable. There's not enough time in this life to reward you for that one mitzvah. The Talmud tells us, the Talmud tells us that if a child is born into existence and he only answers Amen once and then he passes away, he has a share in the world to come. Amen is an acronym for Kel Melech Nemon. God is the truthful power. That's all he said. It merits a share in the world to come. So let me ask when you're in shul and they say Kaddish and you're busy talking your nonsense, look at your cell phone. So you don't even hear what you have to respond to. What are you passing on? Well, yeah, I want to see the weather. I want to see the traffic pattern or I want to see something which I shouldn't see when I'm in a synagogue or in a study hall. For that moment, what have you accomplished? What have you acquired? You'll spend 20 hours at the office working on a deal and the deal doesn't work out. 
and you missed 20 minyanim. And how many Kadeshim did you miss? And how many Kadushas did you say? And how many Borchus did you say? For what? For a dream, which is a pipe dream. Well, you really, but it had a 3% chance it could have worked. You know, it's like buying the lottery ticket. It's like one in 500 million, you may win it when they have the mega lotto. You might as well take the dollar and you know something? Just put it down the sewer. That's, that's, that's your chance of return of, of success. Person all of a sudden becomes very, very religious. It's the initiative. Of course, you don't have to win, but you got you have to take the initiative. It's what they call hishtadlus. You got to take initiative. Of course, right away he's becoming a, a great Jewish thinker. So as you become a Jewish thinker, when you buy, you paid a dollar or five dollars for a lottery ticket. Why don't you become a Jewish thinker and understand the value of an omen and the value of an omen shmei rabo or the value of not speaking when you shouldn't speak? and get credit for remaining silent. As I said, there's no greater enigma and illogical creature on the face of their, this earth than human being. You pay $40,000 to walk and escort the leading Torah sage to the dais, but you don't have five minutes to open the book to study three words. We're gonna stop here to be continued tomorrow. Thank you very much. It's good to see you. Okay.